Are you ready to overcome the complexities and burdens that come with your success? Join the team at Centura Wealth Advisory in the Live Life Liberated podcast. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to Live Life Liberated with the team from Centura Wealth Advisory. Joining me now is your host, Zoe Singh. And Zoe, welcome. And what is today's topic? And I see you have a guest. And who is your guest? Thank you, RJ. Well, today we are. T- um, I will be interviewing Andrea from Exit Consulting Group. And the topic today is preparing business owners for sale, which is something that Andrea's group is expert on. So yeah, thank you so much for coming on today, Andrea. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, a little background on myself. I'm a wealth advisor. I've been with Centura for seven years now. And like you, I work with many business owners, business owners preparing to sell, business owners who have sold. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing more about Exit Consulting Group. Can you share with us, Andrea, more about yourself and your background? Sure. Thanks. So my name is Andrea Steinbrenner. I'm the CEO of Exit Consulting Group. And my background started in operations and accounting, uh, as well as my other two partners. So we all come from a formal accounting background, worked as different layers in accounting departments up through CFO before we joined forces at Exit. So we very much are a numbers-based group, at least that's where we start, but we quickly move into strategy as we work with business owners. So a little bit more about myself. I worked in a professional service firm in San Diego here before I joined Exit. At one point, I was a CFO. It was an outsourced accounting group and realized my passion was really linking arms with the business owner, not just in the transactional work. So I moved into a VP role at that firm and helped grow and scale it out over a five-year clip. So we grew pretty rapidly, opened four regional offices and became nationwide. And that was pretty exciting for us. And that was all under the umbrella of accounting. And I realized there was a bigger reach out there I'd like to go explore. So I still utilize that firm very frequently. But then I linked forces with my current partner, John Overham, who's the founder of Exit. He actually exited a family business about 10 years ago, and it didn't go so well. It was actually pretty traumatic. It broke up part of his family. They didn't get what they wanted out of the business. And so He started telling his story around town, and that's really how ECG was born. Other business owners didn't want to go through that same experience. And statistically, we hear it all the time, right? So I'm Mm -hmm. sure you hear it too. And then furthermore, we brought in another partner, Scott Spohr, also comes from a corporate finance CFO role. And so together, we go out and service the market. And a little bit more about Exit Consulting Group. Can you elaborate on your location, the ideal client, and the service offering? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're located in Southern California, San Diego. Uh, We have clients all over, not just the country, but all over the world. So we're very flexible. Thank you, technology. Yeah. Our our ideal client is privately held, typically. A sweet spot is 10 to 50 million top line. We'd love to see 20% drop to EBITDA, wouldn't everybody? But Mm -hmm. we really try to stay away from more of the startup side per se, not always, but some. If we do get in with startup, we really enter through the growth and scale model. And we once you're over a certain size, you have an internal team. So you don't really need a consulting group anymore. So that's where our market cap comes. Our service offering is very specific around growth and scale headed and or focused on an exit. So our name is pretty indicative of mm-hmm. what we do, but it's not always at the point of exit that we enter a client. In fact, we typically like to enter a client well before a point of exit so that we can really help prepare everyone involved in that. So like I was telling John's story earlier, what we hear more often than not is that business owners or leadership teams feel alone, scared, lost, confused, unsure about this thing called a transition or a transaction. It's pretty common. Most people go through one in their life, right? So to be experts on it is here nor there. Mm -hmm. So we come in and we work with clients as they prepare towards this thing called a transaction. And then how do, what do they do after? And so really we focus on the transition more than the transaction because the transaction is a point in time. So we'll come in and we'll first assess the situation. We either look at a business assessment or an exit assessment, depending on if they're in growth and scale or truly focused on an exit. From there, we figure out a roadmap, whether it's a roadmap to transaction or a roadmap for some of those growth elements we're talking about help them actually do the work, not just give them the plan and say, call us later when you figure it out. And then set them up and tee them up to go find that ideal ideal buyer and or transition plan that 
it stables, stabilizes the company, keeps it a going concern, stabilizes the leadership team, keeps them intact, and then sets that owner or founder up for what do they do when they're no longer the owner and founder. That's really helpful. Thank you. What What do you say that differentiates Exit Consulting Group from your competitors? Yeah, great, great question. I think there's lots of shops who service the market lots of ways and we're all needed. So, you know, we're not for everyone and everyone's not for us. We really take a owner focused approach to our service offering. Most of the time, our owners feel alone, even running their companies, right? Their businesses, their families, the community is all looking to them to have all the answers, know what to do next. And most of the time they do. Uh, but every once in a while, they need someone on their side that can sit on their side of the table and break things down in a way that makes sense. Most of our owners haven't gone through transactions before, and there's new terms and there's new people involved and different steps in the process that they've maybe never heard of. So we're there to help be their advocate for them and really bring alignment amongst all the people involved, not just the buyer and seller, but the CPA and the lawyers and the financial planners, the fiduciaries, the other leadership team, insurance brokers, we could go on and on, but really bring all of them together, get everyone rowing in the same direction, supporting each other in the goals, explaining to the business owner what's going on throughout that time, bridging the gap between the business owner and the leadership team to make sure they're intact and feeling secure and okay with the next steps. And then ultimately, hopefully bringing peace of mind to that business owner, because they know they're not alone. They know there's a plan. They can follow where we're at on the plan and they know someone's got their back. I definitely understand the job of coordinating professionals. That's something that we do when we're helping a yeah. business owner tax plan and it's a full-time job. So it's definitely. Definitely, definitely a service needed that business owners might not know about when they're going to sell, but then they're just extremely thankful for it if they have a team like yourself or us. Absolutely. And do you typically work with business owners who it's it's just the sole business owner and maybe a family, or do you ever work with partners who are interrelated? And Yeah, great question. So we work with everyone in terms mm-hmm. of that realm. So we do, we work in putting partnerships together and breaking them apart. We work in family business. One of our family businesses right now is in their fourth generation, looks very different from when the great grandfather started at the turn of the century. How do you transition that? Right. We work with PE groups and VC groups, bringing them in. We work with strategic buyers that come in. So we kind of work in all the different realms of how you would transition a company, even ESOP. In terms of exit planning. So for us, we are typically uh, looking on the tax planning side when a business owner is thinking about sale, how can sure. we add value by mitigating the income taxes? And we call um, the business owners when they come to us, they're in three different phases. So either the gold, silver, or bronze period. So the gold period for us is prior to the LOI being signed, signed where all tax planning strategies are still available. The silver is after the LOI is signed, letter of intent, but prior to the 1231 of that tax year, some strategies are still available. And then the bronze period is January 1st after the year of sale until the filing of the prior year's business tax returns. There's minimal tax strategies available and the business owners wishing that they engaged us sooner because there were more strategies prior to that. And then alternatively, you guys have something called readiness of an exit. And I was hoping that you could explain that to us. Sure. So I'll try to tackle all these succinctly. (laughs) So tax mitigation, which is a big topic, right? As you're bringing Mm up, you know, you laid it out well, depending on when a client engages and where they're at in their path, uh, determines how much tax prep you can do. But even let's say even post LOI signature, right? Um, What an LOI is trying to determine more than anything is, do we have a buyer? Do we have a seller? And are we close on price and terms? Because even though an LOI is executed, things will still get negotiated up until the last week. It's amazing. So really what we're trying to establish, do we have the right buyer and seller? Are they close on price and terms? And is it time to go deep? And an LOI says yes. At that point in time, let's say a client comes to you and they said, hey, I just... I just, I'm going to sell my company. I just signed an LOI for 10 million bucks. My basis in the company is 2 million bucks. I'm going to have to pay cap gains on 8 million bucks. We're like, that's really terrible, right? What can we do? Well, for in a situation like that, we would look at different structures and how we could actually structure the sale. So they would still get the purchase price. 
they would still get the value. Uh, maybe we bleed it out over time because you're paying tax as you're receiving the cash, right? So we defer that tax out if they don't need all of that money up front. Maybe we put it in a certain tax shelter or vehicle, right? Where it can, if they don't need that right now in terms of a liquidity event, we can bleed it out over time. So those are two very quick high level examples of things that we can do, but there's lots of strategy around there about what to do to mitigate that tax or at least defer it um, in, mm -hmm. into the future. In regards to the readiness question, yes, very much so. We look at what we call the three stages of readiness to see where we're at. So we, when we go in and do our exit assessment, we will look at, is the business ready? And what do we mean by that is what happens if we pull that business owner out of the business tomorrow? Who runs all of its sales? Who does the bookkeeping? Yeah. Who's yeah. signing into the bank? Who's paying the bills? Who's generating new clients, right? Who's got the relationships with the vendors? So is the business ready to operate without that owner or leader? First thing we look at. Second mm -hmm. thing we look at is the market readiness. So we run evaluation on the firm and we say, okay, here's where we think the fair market value is laying out. Are there buyers out there who will pay this for your company? How are the interest rates looking if they're going to go finance it somewhere? What are the comps telling us that are going to happen? So we do, a, we do a deep dive on the market readiness. What are competitors doing right now? And we take a deep dive to see how are we going to line up when we put ourselves out there? And then the last bucket we look at is owner readiness. Truly, how ready is the owner to exit the business? What are they going to do every day when they don't come to the office? What are they going to do next year at the annual gala when they don't have the starship table with their name on the front and the banner up top, right? How's that going to feel? A lot of people will tell us, oh, we'll go golfing, we'll go fishing. Well, I guarantee there's only so many days you can go golfing and fishing before you're done and you need to go do something. Most of our business owners are highly intellectual, highly driven, very motivated. They're not going to stay home and do nothing. So we have to find a plan, whether they consult for the business, know what they're going to do next, have a passion that they're going to go invest in. Um, because otherwise, even up to the date of close, we've had business owners walk away because they didn't know what they were going to do next. How far out from sale do business owners typically seek your services? So you'll love this, Zoe, and you can use this in your practice. Most of the time, 95% of our business owners, when we ask them how far they are from exiting their business, they tell us five years. It's yeah. hilarious. They do it every time. <laughs> One year, way too soon. Too scary, too much to do. 10 years, too far away. Way too much time. Mm -hmm. I want to go do something else with my life but we always get five years. And then when you ask that same business owner the next year, you know what they say? Five years. Five. <laughs> they just keep kicking the can. So yeah. <laughs> um, ideally though, we'd love to have business owners in who say I'm three to five years away. That's enough of a runway for us to prepare those three readiness buckets we're talking about. That's enough time for us to start to pull levers if they don't like the valuation on the company or they're trying to accomplish something specific out of the exit. If it's under that, it's still possible. We can still transact a company. It's just a lot harder and you don't quite get all the things you want out of it. So. Totally. Totally. That's what for us, it's like two to three years at least is probably yeah. the sweet spot because then we can get in there, you know, make sure that they have the right professionals around them as well. What are you seeing in today's market in terms of sale price and volume? You know, there's a lot of chatter right now, but to be honest with you, the market is still hot. It's still ripe. There's a lot of cash flowing through the economy. Um, yes, the interest rates have gone up. Yes, things are more expensive because of that, but they're not at an inconsumable level. They're just different than what everybody's used to. So the rates that we're facing right now and the market that we're facing right now, it's actually a pretty stabilized level. When rates are super, super low, the economy can't grow, right? And so if rates are too expensive, people can't afford anything. And we're actually in very much a middle tier. We're seeing a lot of activity in the private sector in the sweet spot that we're in right now. The other major thing that's happening, which no matter what's going on in the economy would be existing, is baby boomers are rapidly aging out of their businesses right now. That is the number one thing happening in private business. And there's not a lot of next gen people buying businesses. And what I mean by that is many of Generation X and millennials all went to college to go learn a trade and they're now doing that trade. But entrepreneurship wasn't a big topic in that educational generation, if you will. 
And so it's really interesting. We have a bunch of PE groups coming up and strategics and family offices now looking into private sector businesses because we're creating new buying ability by cobbling funds together and putting management teams in place to go out and run these companies. So it's really interesting because it's just a different market of buyers, but there's lots out there and there's money to buy companies. There's still a stable investment. And like I said, even family offices are now moving from real estate to small business in order to stabilize their own trust. So it's exciting. We we can't keep up with the demand. So we, you know, it's going well. Yeah, awesome. That's great to hear. And it's a it's definitely an interesting thing, generational thing of how the demand has changed. So I want to talk to you a little bit more about the sales process and timeline. So sure. when you have a business owner who's ready for sale, can you walk us through how that looks? Sure. So a typical traditional pathway to transaction looks something along the lines of, and I'll, there's two separate paths, but first you decide it's time. You agree on evaluation and you go out and you test the market. If it's an inside sale or an identified buyer, it, you don't have to do so much market research, but you still do evaluation because you have to have somebody who agrees with your valuation to buy your company, even if it's a family member. They have to agree to pay for whatever you're asking. But let's put that on the side. If it's a third-party strategic or PE or something like that who's looking to buy, first thing we do is run what's called a broker's opinion of value, a BOV. That tells us fair market value on the company, and we see how that bears against what's going on. In tandem of doing that, we also put together what's called Confidential Information Memorandum, a SIM is what you hear. Uh, there's two methodologies of doing that right now, and we're actually pivoting more into the advanced one, which we're pretty excited about. There's a paper SIM. So think walking down the street, see a house for sale. There's a flyer in a box. You pick up the flyer in a box. Paper SIM for a house, similar to a company, a little bit more extensive. There's this new platform out on the marketplace called Exio that we've partnered with and collaborated with. And they basically are taking that paper sim of a house and moving it to Zillow, but for companies. So it's pretty exciting because now there's video sims being put on the marketplace, which is reaching so many buyers faster. It's vetting people out so much faster and it's getting to a higher, quicker transaction price. It's pretty exciting. So once we put the marketing collateral together, we put it on the web and we start looking for the buyer. In that, we vet through, I mean, most companies, we get minimum of 100 NDAs, right? But th- you can get hundreds of them. We, th- we float through the NDAs. If they get executed, we execute back. And then the potential buyers get one degree of information on our company. So they get five facts that are sitting in the SIM. We don't disclose the city that they're in. We don't disclose the business name. We say, hey, here's about where they're located. Here's their industry. Here's what kind of revenue they're doing. Are you interested? If they say yes, we open up the next layer with another NDA and that they get a couple more layers of information. And now we're really trying to figure out, do we have a buyer who's really interested, not just curious? We, we try to run that process for like 30 to 60 days if we get a good pool. And what we're trying to do when we open up that second tier of information is to collect what's called IOIs or indication of interest. Indication of interest is non-binding and non-exclusive. So basically, sometimes it comes through in an email, sometimes it's a formal paper, but it says, hey, I want to buy this company and I'm willing to pay this for it. And these are what I'm presenting as potential terms. We take those to all of our sellers and we say, hey, here's the different options out there. Which one do you like? Sometimes it's not the highest purchase price. Sometimes it's the strategy about why they want to buy it. Sometimes it's the terms that they want to buy it. Mm -hmm. From there, we try to lock one in. And when we lock one in, we ask them to submit an LOI. Once we're under an executed LOI, letter of intent, now it's still non-binding. Anyone can walk away at any time, but it's exclusive now. We can't talk to anybody else. Now we're going steady. In that period of time, the buyer gets to go through a period of uh, called due diligence. And basically they get the ability to go in and look at all of our records and say, everything we've told you up to this point, you can go test and see if you find the same information. So the only thing they wouldn't get is like confidential employee records, but they get to see our accounting system. They get to come in and look at our org chart. They get to look at our customer contracts. They get to look at our vendor contracts. They get to see what's going on in the business and say, yep, this all test proof. Once we get through there and we're leading towards that closing date because everything's looking good, we knock our attorneys and our CPAs and our financial planners on the shoulder and say, okay, guys, we got a deal coming. This is looking good. 
So the attorneys draft our purchase sale agreements. The CPA start playing tax mitigation with the wealth planners. We, awesome. So from there, we're laying down the roadmap. We set a date for close. On the date of close, final dr drafts are set between buyer and seller. They both ink them. They pass them. They both wet ink them again. It can be electronic, but you get the precipice. Yeah, yeah. Then they each get to keep their own version of wet docs. Money's transferred through escrow and the deal's closed. Awesome. You guys are super buttoned up with this. You know, it can be a very tedious process, I think, on the business owners. And, and with regards to the other professionals, do you ever bring different professionals that you're used to working with if the client does not have, yep. say, yeah. an M&A? Okay. Absolutely. So if we had a client come in and said, Andrew, I want to sell my business next year, I'd say, great. Who are who's your wealth planner? Who's your CPA? Who's your attorney? And if they said we don't have them, we'd say, call Zoe. She can get you set up. You need to get your you need to get going with them so that when we get close, we have a plan in place. For these different service providers, how how soon would an, the different ones like legal, tax, bank, are they in the process from the beginning when the business owner is just starting to think about selling or when do they come into yeah if they especially if they're already part of the bench of the business owner we mm -hmm. absolutely include them we're very collaborative and we like everybody to be in the know uh, sure. that being said we don't want to just start having our client get charged dollars for people being in the know so we usually ask for like a kickoff meeting with them and introduce and say here's the process here's the timeline and then as we get close or when we get to the different points we need to run something past them or bring them in we don't hesitate to do it that's awesome yeah so you're efficient but also want to be you know cognizant of their, yeah. their time which is definitely sometimes a concern of this the business owner clients sure and then one last thing I wanted to touch on was that you also work on exit planning for inside buyers, which is, you know, different than the outside buyers, which is what we've mostly spoken about. So you work with business exits for in-between family, ESOPs, key employees, and family versus non-family partners. Um, we do. Can, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah. So that process is a little bit different. Still the back half of everything I talked about happens in theory, but really it's more about we spend most of our first couple months with the parties involved creating alignment and getting everybody on the same page. Many times in those situations, the key employees, the family members, the part, the minority partners, they don't necessarily know everything that the person selling does. And so first we have to bring them up to speed. And that happens in an iterative process. It happens in an iterative process because it takes some time to actually pull out everything that these people need to know and don't know. And it takes some time to get the business owner comfortable with it, right? These are now right. people who have access to information that before didn't. Um, from there, we sit, we make sure that the strategic alignment of the goals are close because if these are closely held companies with inside people buying, they're not normally going to just change the strategy of the company or the culture, right? Yeah. And that's not the intent. So we flush all that out to make sure there's no surprises. And then we start negotiating the deal. The deal is usually not super hard to negotiate. There's usually not tons of due diligence done or anything like that because it's pretty easy to access the information and vet it out. But there are a lot of emotions. There's more emotions typically in it. And so it's us just getting them all on the table, making sure we're talking about goals of both sides, making sure we're creating a path. What we don't want is to split up partnerships and families. That to us is mm -hmm. the worst outcome. Mm -hmm. So our goal, goal is to find a path that everybody can agree with. And usually they don't agree with everything on the path, but if we can get both sides at 90%, the 10% becomes immaterial. That's awesome. Yeah, I definitely have some clients in that position and it is a, it's more personal. and Very sensitive. And more, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. Not, not an easy front. Well, I want to thank you, Andrea, so much for coming on to our podcast. This was really very informative and looking forward to connecting more. If anyone else has that's listening wants to get in hold of you and learn more, how can they get in contact with you? Yeah, thank you so much. So definitely they can reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm Andrea Steinbrenner with Exit Consulting Group in San Diego, California. I will share my contact information with you too, as well as always, so if they need to reach out, they can. And they can also call the firm and they can get be put in touch with us right away, as well as they can also fill out a form on our website and reach out. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm Zoe Singh. If you want to contact me, our website is centurawealth.com. Thank you so much for listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast and have a great day.
Thank you. Thank you, Zoe and Andrea. And most importantly, thank you for listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast with the team from Centura Wealth Advisory. If you have not subscribed to the podcast, please click the subscribe button below. This way, when the team comes out with a new podcast, it will show up directly on your listening device. And we humbly ask you to share this podcast, rate it, and leave a review because this actually helps others find the show. Again, thank you for listening and for everyone at Centura Wealth Advisory. I'm RJ Malik, reminding you to live your best day every day, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Live Life Liberated podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Centura Wealth Advisory. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Centura Wealth Advisory, Centura, is an SEC registered investment advisor with its principal place of business in San Diego, California. Centura and its representatives are in compliance with the current registration and notice filing requirements imposed on SEC registered investment advisors, in which Centura maintains clients. Centura may only transact business in those states in which it is notice filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Tax relief varies based on client circumstances and all clients do not achieve the same results.